is what will happen. We have also invited press to this se to the session. Are there any members of the press here? No. Okay. So if, do, if members of the press do come in, we may have them ask questions as well. All right. Um, this is a, a session for you to talk to the three of us and also to share new ideas to generate some new conversation. Um, the three of us are far from the only leaders in the asexual community. We just agreed to do this panel. And so we'd like to, you know, at the beginning to say that, that there are lots of other people that also do incredible and amazing work um, in the asexual community. We're just the ones on this particular panel. And by no means complete. As I said in the introduction, my name is Sarah Beth Brooks. I'm the founder of Asexual Alliance. Um, this is our fifth year doing it. It will be October 26th to November 1st this year. So uh, if you grab one of the flyers that are sitting in the back, uh, they're a little postcard size with an ace flag on them. We can give you the date, our website, and a little information. And then uh, you can also, on our website, find many resources. We have one of the largest set of downloadable resources on the internet available for you. Brochures, pamphlets, oh look, excellent. <laughs> Somebody has handed me this. These are our postcards. I will apologize in advance for the typo on the back. <laughs> when they came in, it was too late for me to be ordered. So if you grab one of these postcards, you'll then have our uh, web address, as well as some information about Asexual Awareness Week on the back. We also call it Ace Week, which is something that came out of the community to call it Ace Week. Um, I'm willing to talk about just about anything today, asexual leadership-wise. Um, I'm hoping that you all have some questions. I'm going to turn it over to the lovely guy. Hello, um, I am known as Ivy to my friends, these guys, all of you, hopefully. Um, I also write professionally under my legal name, which is Julie Sonder Decker. This is my book that is coming out in September. And um, of course, lots of people know me online as Swipe Ivy. I make YouTube videos, and I complain a lot on my blog. <laughs> 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 on, uh, YouTube, on YouTube, sometimes I read my hate mail, which is also fun. And, um, I, uh, I have written this book partly because um, there's only been really two other books that have been about addressing like, what asexuality is and how it's relevant to everyone. Uh, one was a textbook, it was not written from an asexual perspective, it was Anthony Bogart's book, Understanding Asexuality. So it is a textbook, it is academic, and it is priced academically. Um, <laughs> and uh, then a self-published book by Asexuality Archive. Available. And the problem with uh, self-published books is that they're, they're usually excellent, but they are not as accessible to from bookstores. And a lot of times with older generations especially, we find a problem with legitimacy. So I, I really wanted to get the content out there so that when these young people are coming out to their parents, um, their parents are going to go to the bookstore, they're going to find something rather than, oh, there's nothing on this. So it must not exist, and that you know, contributes to the invisibility we already face. So this is released in September 2nd, and these are advanced reading copies. They're paperback. So uh, the, the actual edition that is released in September is gonna be hardcover. It should also be released in ebook at the same time. And we're talking about audio. And uh, right now, today at this conference, I will be taking uh, entries for a raffle to win one of these. It's unfinished has a couple of mistakes in it, but it's the content. So uh, if you want to enter to win one of these, you can see my table uh, during tea cake and during lunch. So I'll be out there. And uh, other than that, um, that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to turn it over to David. Uh, I can't see the title from here. I can't believe I didn't mention my title. <laughs> Thanks 
Uh, so I want to thank, we mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, but in case there are any people from the press or because it all bears saying again, I want to thank um, the Ryerson Student Union for this space that they uh, contributed to us. This is a fantastic area for us to be able to gather in. Um, I want to give a huge thanks um, and invite a round of applause to Listen Up Canada. They're the ones who helped to sponsor our ASL interpreters. Uh, uh, and to um, and also to the Avon community for crowdfunding the rest of the sponsorship for our uh, for the ASL interpretation, which um, this is the first year we've had interpretation at the conference, and I think that that really kind of opens up what I want to talk about, which is that we are um, becoming much more inclusive as a community. We are beginning, we are making that inclusivity a priority in many, many ways. Um, and that's something that I think our community has been working towards for a long time. And seeing that really manifest itself, and uh, seeing lots of ways that's manifesting itself, is I think one of the most important things going on in the community for, you, for me right now. Um, and I think that's being reflected in the way that the outside world is acknowledging us. I'll tell you a little bit about what I mean. So, uh, we had another conference like this in New York that was not quite as giant and fabulous. We had maybe 60 people show up. Uh, but the thing that I noticed when 60 people showed up in New York is that the kinds of people who showed up, the diversity of people who showed up, was really different than the kind of diversity that we get online. Uh, if you look at the membership of AVEN, our median age right now is 24. Um, there we are mostly, not entirely, mostly from English-speaking countries, mostly from uh, more economically privileged backgrounds, where most uh, are, even though our communities, uh, except for people of color, we have skewed to be a largely white people. And when you look at the people who are showing up at conferences like this, people who show up when we convene in the real world, it's much more diverse, much more diverse in terms of age, much more diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, much more diverse in terms of ability. Um, it's, um, uh, we, we are creating a more open and accepting space, and we have a much wider range of people who are showing up, and I think that that is the huge next step for our movement. And what, um, one of the reasons it's a huge next step is that it opens up a lot of conversations that we've started to have but haven't been able to have it opens up conversations about asexuality and age, and asexuality and aging, that I think our, our community really deeply needs to have. Um, it's helping to push forward conversations about asexuality and ability. We've had incredible research um, and related to that, um, asexuality and health services. So we've had, a, uh, we've had incredible research about our community that's happened um, that has resulted in uh, us being largely delisted by the American Psychiatric Association as a mental disorder. Um, they used to have something called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is when you had to get like sex enough. Now, um, now that's been revised so that we're not included. Uh, and there's a huge discussion about what happens when an asexual person walks into a therapist's office. How can we train mental professionals to be more effective? There's some really important discussions about asexual characters in the media. There's really important discussions about the intersection of the ace and LGBT community, especially the trans community, because there's so many people in the ace community who are at a wide range of places on the gender spectrum. And so uh, I guess I'll wrap up by saying that those are all discussions I'm really excited about. Um, those are discussions that I'm excited about. Uh, I'm excited about engaging with everyone in this audience to see who is interested in happy part of those discussions. I'd like to piggyback on what David said about medical issues. One of the other medical issues that I'm really interested in is for people with vaginas to have gynecological visits. This is something that uh, I've heard a lot of people uh, that I've, ta I've talked to on the internet through my Facebook page or through AVEN that uh, people aren't necessarily getting a gynecological visit. So one of the medical conversations that I think is important for us moving forward is to talk about that kind of uh, healthcare service for people because it's uh, cancer screening and has very little to do with sexual activity at all. 
And so I think that that's one of the things that as we move forward with the health conversation is vital to us as a community to educate ourselves on. And before we open for questions, um, I just, I'm, I'm, I want to kind of do a couple show of hands. How many people are, would be interested in being part of a conversation about asexuality and health? Asexual, physical health, mental health. How many people are interested in being, would be interested in being part of a conversation about asexual, asexual representation in the media? Um, it's like what Abby's doing. How about um, asexual representation in LGBTQ communities? Cool. All right. Seems like we're hitting all the yeah. all the, all the highlights <laughs> there. Um, Excellent. So with uh, with that, um, oh, and one other thing that uh, a quick story I want to share because I'm really excited about it. Um, I uh, went. I was invited to speak at the um, an organization. Uh, called Planned Parenthood in New York State. Uh, We've been trying to get for four years. We've been trying to talk to them for four years uh, because they do uh, some of some of the most. Uh, they're one of the biggest groups in the New York area doing comprehensive sex education, and they invited me in to speak to their entire staff of about forty people that goes around and does sex education in schools all around the New York area. Um, and these are people who had never really thought about asexuality before, never really understood our community. I got up during their lunch break and I talked to them. Um, and for the first time, they, uh, it's ever happened in an organization, they said, wow, this is incredible, we're not talking about this, and we need to change our curriculum to include asexual discourse and sex education. Uh, and I've been beginning to have more and more discussions with people who are in the education space who are acknowledging us in large part because of the research that's been done, because of the good work that's been done. Um, so that's another really popular area of opportunity right now. So with um, that, I'd like to open up for any questions that people have. All right, so going back to what you were saying earlier, uh, just briefly about Stephen uh, Peter, uh, and as a moderator for the PA at Symphony Forum, you see a lot of your people coming up on that forum and having some serious issues with uh, coming up with their parents and facing other difficulties um, just, in, just in regards to that, right? So do you, is there any actual personal plans for further development of resources uh, for, for these young people so they can you know, make life a little easier for them? Um, so Maybe you can help piggyback on this. So sure. I've been, um, we've been talking with Planned Parenthood. We've also been talking with a group called the Trevor Project. Um, they started as a LGBT youth suicide prevention hotline and have sort of expanded to be an online support group, online and phone-based support group for queer youth. Uh, and they have been really enthusiastic about educating their staff about asexuality and building safe spaces for ACEs and people who question ACE identity to talk about their experience online. Um, AVEN is clearly one, but I think building out other ones and building out other places that are local that people can go to are gonna be really important. Um, so right now we're at a place where probably many, probably most at this point, campus queer groups, which are a safe space that people use to um, come in person and talk about issues of identity are learning how to be ace inclusive and ace positive. That's not yet true in high schools. Uh, and there's really powerful work that we need to mobilize around to make that true in high schools. The Gay Straight Alliance Network in California includes us in all the conferences. Um, there's a really amazing relationship that we could be forming um, with LISTEN, the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network. But that's something that I'd love to follow up with you one-on-one -on -one about if that's something you and to piggyback on that, the Trevor Project was the very first LGBT organization that became asexual inclusive. That happened in 2012. So we were on the leading edge of this as far as asexuality and specifically LGBT services, right? Now your question is more about asexual youth about where they should be able to find resources outside of AVEN, right? Uh, in, uh, that is a part of it. Like I say, basically what I'm trying to find is 
identity 
these both for romantic and for sexual spectrum. So I talk about how you can be in the middle, you can be anywhere on that spectrum. And um, there are several sections that, that in the book that bring in the middle ground. Oh, um, there is a section for, uh, I, I have a section in there called the Asexual People of Color. Um, there isn't a section that's directed toward uh, people specifically international, but it does discuss that some of these aspects of the culture are only applied to how it's manifesting in the West right now. So there's still a lot to be done on that. and. There's a lot of stuff that I would like to talk about that I didn't feel qualified to talk about. So I mostly just acknowledge that in um, the English-speaking world and in the West, you're going to see these manifestations while there may be different problems and uh, different uh, attitudes in countries other than the ones in the West that I'm mostly talking about. So the children of the Western traditional culture, is it based on the Greek culture? It, but based on what? The Greek culture. Greek? Yeah. I, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, you could, you could say that when we're talking broadly about the West, uh, sorry, is it okay? Oh, That's no, not it. So we're talking about broadly in the West, we're talking about both American and European, which I suppose, yes, you can trace back to, to Greco-Roman sort of culture, as opposed to Asian cultures, African cultures, or South American cultures, which developed their own sorts of identities prior to colonialization and uh, were able to sort of develop their own ways of talking about these things. For example, there's an article that was out recently about race and asexuality by um, a person named Alok, who, we, who David and I have met. Uh, and this article talks about the ways that sexuality intersects with his South Indian identity uh, and ways in which that develops differently. Um, as somebody who's white and who grew up in America, I don't feel like I have the qualifications to build a community for people who are people of color who also may identify as asexual or somewhere on the asexual spectrum. But I do know that there are people trying to build that community. There is a thread on AVEN that's a pinned thread, and there's conversation that's happening there as well. But as I was saying earlier in a, a group that I was sitting in in the previous session, um, there is a lot of holes in what we are able to do as leaders in the community because of the youth, of, uh, the, not youth as in young people, but youth as in our community is very young. And so there are things like asexuality and race and culture that haven't been addressed yet because nobody's come along and addressed them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, identify as uh, Christian. I don't know what the exact number is. I could pull it off my computer for you. In 2011, Ace Week did a survey where we surveyed 3,500 self-identified asexual people and asked them a variety of demographic questions, including religion. And the majority of them, I, maybe it's not the majority, but the plurality of them at least, identified as atheist. Um, and then there was uh, several other religions that were also identified as. Uh, that data is available on our website. Uh, the bow tie. Okay. Um, so I think it's really great that you already mentioned um, the issue of education, and I think that it's also really great that this will be a coverage coming out by sexuality. But whenever I look at the comments in the public, the public law schools, um, the main question is if we ask them to know what they want from visibility. So um, I'm thinking about how is the best way to frame them. I don't want to say it is actually like Canada, but <laughs> how, how to discuss issues of You're looking, you're looking at me. Okay. No, no, I, I'm looking at you because I have, I have an answer to this, but I want to say, like yeah. To say. Okay, say your seven things, and I'll pick you back on three. Cool. <laughs> Ivy, you should pick yours. Um, so, uh, there was a study that came out a little while ago um, by uh, two people named McKinnis and Hodgson. Were they Canadian? I think they're Canadian. Not sure. Um, and this is the first study we've ever seen on discrimination against asexual people. 
And uh, what, they, what it found, it, it used a couple of standard uh, methods that have been used to study discrimination in the uh, LGBT community. And they found that among prospective landlords and among prospective employers, discrimination against asexual people was as likely as discrimination against uh, LG, uh, LGB people, lesbian, gay, and bi people. Which I think was, his, was uh, a finding that was in some ways not surprising, definitely sobering. I know that this is definitely something that I've experienced in my employment search. Like I've had job interviews where the first five minutes of the job interview was someone asking me about my sexuality before, and then I had to like get them out of that to <laughs> talk about the job. Um, uh, there are, and, and so what was, so questions of bias are ones that our community is just beginning to address. Having the first asexual characters on television means that we're getting to the point where the world might know enough about asexuality, they can start forming misconceptions about us. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're doing really amazing work to stop that from happening, but it's not that we're going to be visible, the word's going to be out there, that everyone's just going to get it. Um, and I think we know something about what those misconceptions are going to look like. Uh, if you look at, so back to the McKinnis and Hodgson study, um, they did a kind of word association game with people where they had them associate different words and asked them what words they associated with asexual. And the words that came up um, were mechanistic and inhuman. Robotic. Robotic. There was this idea that, and this is moving out now out from the study to my personal understanding of this, having done a lot of education uh, around asexuality. Uh, I think that there is this uh, sense that asexual people are missing something fundamental about our humanity. That's not true, but, there, but that is a sense that exists. Um, for many people, uh, the concept of sex and the concept of human emotional connection are Velcro together. So uh, if I say that I'm not interested in having sex with people. <coughs> what they hear is not that there's this one narrow set of physical activities they don't like doing with people. What they hear is I am not interested in or not capable of connecting with other people or myself in a meaningful way, which is a really different thing. And I think that the part of the reason that we hear those words like robotic and inhuman being thrown around now that we have enough visibility to see how people react, is that people, when, when they hear asexual, they're imagining someone who does not connect, does not know how to, does not have a desire to. And that's really, really different from what our community is. And so I think that the, the kind of work that we have beyond visibility, in, in addition to all the things that we've just been talking about, right? The, the mental health stuff, the broader health stuff, the education stuff, the interactive sex with LGBT, the stuff, the media, but the work that we have is to unvelcro those concepts. I think that we are leading a discussion that is kind of helping the broader world realize that connection and intimacy can be things that exist without sexuality. People can form those and we as a sexual can live really amazing lives that are filled with deep connections with ourselves, deep connections with other people, um, the don't of all sexuality. And I think that's a shift in a much broader social discussion um, than just a discussion about our community. But I think that that's, that's part of what we're going to be, do to be truly accepted. And I think that Velcroing is a function of Western society, right? Yes. Right? That Velcroing is a function of the ways in which we think about life in Europe and in the States and in Canada, but not necessarily a function of the way we think of, of the way that people who grow up in Asia or people who grow up in Africa think about life, right? And so I think that largely it's, it's a critique of Western society. But I think back to your question, which is what do asexual people want beyond education and visibility? Let me give you a laundry list. <laughs> I have a laundry list. Family protections. What if three people want to raise a baby together? How do all three of them have parental rights 
for that child, right? Uh, employment protection, just like David. So I've been running Asexual Awareness Week for five years. It's on my re I was on, I became unemployed in 2011. I had Asexual Awareness Week on my resume to show that I was doing something with my time of being unemployed. I spent two years unemployed. I took Asexual Awareness Week off my resume and got a job interview the next week. So that's part, it's, it's a bias that's not being stated yet, but it's clearly there, right? And now when I go for a job interview, I don't talk about any of this. Because otherwise I can't get a job, right? Um, and there have been studies done about LGBT activism on your resume. And if you send two identical resumes, one with LGBT activism and one with not, the one with not will get the phone call. So there's that. Family protections, employment protections, health care. We need a broader conversation with our mental health providers, with our physical health providers, about asexual health care. For example, I told this story earlier on, when I was trying to find out about asexuality, I had a therapist, a sex therapist, a gynecologist, and my GP. Not a single one of them said the word asexuality to me. I found it on Google, after I had been on hormones for a year. So, there needs to be a broader conversation with medical professionals. And then on top of that, we need better media representation. We need better inclusion in LGBT spaces because, like David alluded to earlier, there are some college campuses that have this programming. I don't think it's most. I, I, I disagree. And I've talked to a lot of I, It's not most. There was a, a person who was sitting over here during the uh, session earlier who was telling me about how their campus doesn't have any sort of programming at all. And we hear no programming to we had an asexual awareness week once to we have a regular group on campus. There's a wide spectrum, right? So all of those things are things that we want beyond just, you know, hey, we exist and we're not broken or sick. I, I, do you want to jump in on that before? No, no, no. So if you're, so I can speak about U.S. employment law, because I, mean, uh, I, I live in the U.S. In the U.S., they're not allowed to ask in they're some places. In okay, and so in Canada, no. But in some places in the U.S., they get around it by asking things about, like, who you live with, or what your social life is like, and things like that. So you have a couple of options. One, wear your ace flag, you know, wear your ace flag proudly, right? in my cost of the job. Uh, I had to stop doing that despite how much I love the work that I do in this community. I had to stop doing that. Um, the other option that you have is, is to hide it. And that's a sad option for me to have to even offer to you at this point. But unfortunately, the only state in the United, the only place in the world that we know of that has asexuality and employment protections is the state of New York. And uh, yeah, the selfies in the back, like, yeah! If you all have a met Southpaw back there, the yeah. amazing Southpaw from New York City. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, New York has it, but New York doesn't have it because we went out and advocated for it. New York has it because, believe it or not, they used it as a cover to get uh, employment protections for homosexual and bisexual people. Because if they put asexual in there too, the Republicans would complain about it less. <laughs> so, uh, and th that all happened in the early 2000s before our community was really organized enough to have employment protections. Now, at this point in the game, uh, we're in touch with the folks who are working on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act in the states, which is, would be a federal piece of legislation that would cover everyone. For those of you who don't know, in the United States, you can be fired for your sexual orientation in 29 states. You can be fired for your gender identity in 38 states. So this is a problem that... That's okay. So if you are gay, lesbian, or bisexual, you can be fired in 29 states. If you are transgender or gender nonconforming in some way, you can be fired in 38 states. So here's the thing, in Iowa, you can get gay married, 
but you can't put the picture of you and your spouse at the wedding on your desk at work because you could get fired. So they're trying to get the Employment Non-Discrimination Act passed in the U.S. now. We're trying to get asexuality into this. And so we've been lobbying on that. We've been working with the Transgender Leadership uh, Coalition, um, the National Center for Transgender Equality, the amazing Lauren Heasling, yeah. who, we just, we, who we love. And um, we had a meeting about this with her about a year and a half ago because Congress in the United States actually had a meeting about asexuality being in ENDA. And Mara came to us to be like, hey, they're having these meetings. You should probably go be in these meetings. So that is a process that we're working on right now. But for the moment, your options are to wear it proudly and make a complaint if something happens, or to not talk about it. And I would say that uh, you, if you feel uncomfortable disclosing your sexual orientation to anyone for any reason, you shouldn't feel like for the cause you have to. So uh, one of the things that I recommend, especially to uh, young people or people who live in a, a place that feels conservative or oppressive in some way, um, that if you feel like your safety or your mental health is in danger uh, for disclosing this, you can use a, a workaround such as, well, I've never found anyone I felt that way about, but I'm fine for now. You know, and that way you're answering the question and you're also not saying some label, you're not Using a, a word that they can Google or a word that they can judge you by, if you're just saying, well, I've never had this experience. And people are less hostile about that for some reason. That would be my advice. I'm not sure. That, I, I'm in criminal justice. It's hard to hear for those types of questions. Like, like, 
we, uh, uh, we felt a lot of things that you felt. And so it became such a thing to like jump into these threads and have a pile on and be like, yay, we're glad you did. Um, that they found a little picture of cake and they started posting cake in those threads as a way of saying, welcome, you're accepted here, we feel the things that you feel. Yeah, yeah, sure, and, <laughs> and so cake started as that. It was a little emoji. Like a little, like oh, a little okay. graphic of cake. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of expanded out from that to be something that appeared whenever people want to celebrate something in the ACE community. So now whenever we have, whenever we have meetings, people eat cake. It's kind of like the rainbow in, uh, in the water. I also have data on cake versus pie. <laughs> <laughs>
a show called uh, Godiva's, it's also canceled, that had a, I think his name was Martin, uh, an asexual character, but he identified as asexual, he used that word, but I think that he was fixed later with hormones, which was terrible. Um, in mainstream media, uh, we've also, of course, had the terrible Dr. House episode, um, which portrayed to, uh, if you haven't seen it, it was uh, Dr. House is, you know, this uh, doctor that's a, a genius and he's a pretty awful person in general. And uh, he had a, a, a his, his co-doctor um, came to him saying, I have an asexual patient. And Dr. House says, well, that's impossible because if you don't want sex, you are dead, dying, or lying. And so he decided by the end of the episode, he was going to figure out what was, what was wrong with her and find a medical reason for her asexuality. And what ended up happening is uh, because of the rules of the bet and whatnot, he was not allowed to test this woman. So he tested her husband, who turned out he was also asexual. And he turned out to have a pituitary tumor that was causing his lack of interest in sex. And um, when he was going to, uh, I guess, agree to the surgery or something, his, his, his wife said, oh, actually, I've been lying to spare your feelings. So they, they cured not one but two asexual people in that episode. And the hero doctor of the episode gets to smoke his cigar and say, see, everyone wants sex unless they're dead, dying, or lying. And that's that note we end on. And the person who wrote that episode was confused about why we were upset about it. So, like, we got you a lot of traffic, come on. Well, yeah, you did. Actually, the person who wrote the episode originally was going to have the house not be able to cure them. Supposedly, yeah. And then the editor stepped in and said that that wasn't an interesting enough storyline. Right, but you didn't have to cure both of them, right? Like, that's yeah. our point, is that if you, wanted to, if you wanted to still be respectful of our identity as, as something that isn't cured, um, then you could have had, you didn't have to have the wife to say that. So, um, but anyway, um, so that was a, t a terrible representation in the media. Um, then you get the, you know, the less, uh, the, the, the less obvious ones who just you guess that they might be asexual or they seem not very driven by sex in the media. So we see those characters here and there. Um, the documentaries, the Sherlock's. The Sherlock's, the um, Sheldon. Yeah. Um, but also, one thing that we should really be looking for also is um, uh, stuff that is not on mainstream media channels like web comics. And there's so many, there, there seems to be, I can, I've seen around a dozen web comics in just the last couple of years that have popped up with asexual characters. Some of them are main characters in the web comics. Um, we see them on TV shows, we see them. Um, the, in the web comics, every once in a while we see them in a book. There, are a few, I, I've actually listed a few examples in here um, of the of the books that have asexual characters that actually use the word asexual in a way that's similar to us. So, um, other than that, like, what else did you want? To, you just wanted some examples of how, how it's been handled. Yeah. yeah um, Add a couple things to that. Yeah, yeah. Before you add a couple of things to that, we are coming close to the end of this session, so oh, if you have yes. So if you, because we like to talk, uh, if you have a burning question that you want to make sure gets asked, think about it while David's talking because we'll have time for just one or two more questions. Go ahead. I'll be super fast then. Um, uh, there is, you mentioned Sherlock, Doctor Who, um, and Sheldon. So in broader popular culture, we know that they're researching the asexual community actively when they write for those characters because they're in interviews they're using words like aromantic to describe the characters, mm -hmm. um, and so. There's, uh, we're informing uh, dialogue in the media. If you look at the large, like, biggest, the characters with the biggest reach, they're all, they all are pretty similar looking. They're all kind of on the autistic spectrum, white, male, lanky, kind of in their mid-20s. And so building a broader representation for mainstream press is really important, and the best way to do that is to tell our own stories in our own creative content and have those bubble up. Actually, uh, Poppy from Huge might have been based on me, I'm not sure. Because in, in an interview, the creator of, of Huge said, I got the idea from watching a girl on YouTube. 
and I was one of the only people who was doing it at that time. So it might have been me, but I never got the answer. <laughs> about asexuality, and there are many misconceptions, is that we're boring. <laughs> because because what do you do if you don't have sex? How do you have a romantic relationship without sex? How do you have any relationship without sex? Because, and specifically as we've been talking about in Western culture, sex and intimacy are intertwined, and the penultimate desire of success is to get married and have babies, right? or to at least get married, right? And so that monogamous, romantic, sexual relationship is the definition of success in our society. And so when people are confronted with asexuality in their world, and they have never thought of that before, they think, well, that must be such a boring experience, right? How many of you are boring people? <laughs> this is how <laughs> So, uh, so I think that that's part of it, right? And part of that level of narrative that we are not boring people has not yet trickled into the media, in, into the mainstream representations of us as people. For example, I have an awesome set of complicated, amazing relationships that function in my world that all serve different purposes that are beautiful and brilliant, right? That could be a really cool story. Not me, because I don't want to be too but, um, but some other story about it, right, could be very interesting. Um, there's a web uh, series that's on right now called Aces. You can Google it online. Uh, it's written by an asexual person, and it's about asexuality. So uh, that's the one place where we're getting some better representation, and some representation that's coming from us. I also think that as our median age grows, as David said earlier, it's 24 on the website right now. It's different when we get in person. As our median age grows and as we get a more broad community, we will find writers who are asexual. We will find celebrities who are asexual. We will find all of these different sort of nuances. Like, if you can compare it to the transgender community right now, right? Now you finally have things like the transgender representation on Orange is the New Black and the transgender representation in other television shows and things like that that are actually being played by transgender people. Right? Can you imagine an asexual person playing an asexual character on a regular <laughs> show? I <laughs> know. Um, and it hasn't happened yet, but it will, right? And that's part of what this education work that we're all doing in different ways is so crucial to sort of push that forward. Um, so the last question I'm going to take is, is from you with the with the backpack in your lap, and then we're going to wrap up. Is Michael is lunch next? Um, lunch is next, yes. And um, where would you like them to go? Um, just outside here. I mean, there's definitely time for more questions because I think that nobody else has come yet. So good excellent, day. perfect. Hi. Okay. Uh, kind of to touch back on the other question with with asexuality being portrayed in the media and and whether there's asexual characters or not. Um, that is one thing that. I've not seen all that much of, but one thing I have seen a lot of is a whole lot of noise about the only valid, the only valid relationships that are loving relationships are sexual relationships. And that if you don't have sex in your relationship, that means you don't love the person. That's a huge, huge hurdle, even with the appearance of the sexual characters, to come up against. And is there any real way to start to try to try to write that? Write more content <laughs> that that portrays our community and portrays our relationships in a way that is interesting, right? Because right now, the same thing that the person in front here was saying, right now they think we're boring. 
right? Because the Velcroing that we've been talking about this entire session, love, sex, and intimacy, all go together as one without delineating them out. That Velcroing is what's creating the mindset that our lives are so boring, why would they even cover them? And the interesting thing I found is that when I actually sit down and name that assumption, when I actually sit down and say like, hey, average sexual person, do you think that people need to be sexual to form emotionally intimate, meaningful relations with one another? They're like, no, I don't think that. Like, they, they know on some level that that's not true, but so much of the dialogue that exists in our society reinforces that assumption that it just kind of slips into people's thinking. So I think if, if we can name it, if we can call it out, and we can start creating content about the ways it's not true, then that there's something really powerful that we can create. And that, again, takes time and mm -hmm. takes the development of asexual writers like Ivy and the other writers that are writing about asexuality. She got the book deal first. But <laughs> there, are, there are other people who are writing about fiction books about asexuality and asexual characters. I'm doing that next. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that actually goes more beyond something that's just asexual targeted, though. I think that just maybe somebody who's aware of asexuality or is asexual who's just writing for a mainstream audience just so that those ideas get more out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's all work we have to do. Uh, so we still have another couple of minutes, Michael said, so in the back there. Um, just one subject of web series that have asexual characters. Do I see you want to Yeah. yeah. Um, just one subject of web series. Um, recently, there was this Tumblr post going around where someone was like, imagine a show where there's a pansexual and an asexual, yeah. and the pansexual is really introverted, and the asexual is really outgoing, and it's called All or Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> And so we're just following the same pattern. 
the same model. David and I have these conversations where we're like, well, what did they do? <laughs> we're just going to do that. <laughs> and we're going to make it a little asexy, but we're going to do that. <laughs> so, which is where Asexual Awareness Week came from, right? There's a Transgender Awareness uh, uh, Week that happens, uh, that, that used to be very popular and isn't as much anymore because now they have Day of Remembrance and Day of Empowerment. Those are the two major trans events every year. But we were like, we'll just have an awareness rate. And now we're in the fifth year of that. So it takes all of us working together. Uh, and all of us can be leaders in that way. It's the three of us are sitting here, but everyone in this room has the ability to be a leader to push this forward. So I think it's time for lunch. Is anybody hungry? Yes. yes. Me too. I have no idea what's for lunch, but my guess is that it will be downstairs on the next floor. So I hope that you all learn.